Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to MOS Live. If you're on Zoom, we do have closed captioning available, and you can turn those on by selecting the CC or closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and selecting show subtitles. In just a few moments, we will be meeting our educators who will be taking us on a journey through space. My name is Francisca, I use she and her pronouns, and I'll be your moderator today. And although you see me now, you'll mostly be hearing my voice throughout the rest of the presentation as I share your questions or observations with our educators. If you're watching us on Zoom, you can submit your questions or observations using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And if you're watching us on Facebook or YouTube, I'm so sorry, we cannot see your questions, but we're so happy to have you with us today and we hope you enjoy our program. So now that we know how our session will work, I'd like to invite our educators to turn on their cameras and introduce themselves. Hello everybody, my name is Talia. I use she, her pronouns and I'm going to be your presenter today, which means I'm going to be doing the talking, but I cannot do this alone. Hi everyone, my name is Katie. My pronouns are she and her and I will be your pilot today flying you through space. And today we are continuing our April theme of top five lists where Katie and I pick a topic and we pick our top five um, things that will fit on that list. And today we are talking about solar system destinations. So what we're going to be looking at are my top five solar system destinations. And the way I defined that are places in the solar system that I think we really need to explore more that we need to learn more about because they seem like they're going to be really fascinating places. And to start with my number five pick is uh, not visible on this shot of the solar system that Katie is showing you right now, right? We're using a, uh, a software called NASA Eyes. It is free, it's open source, you can use it yourself. Uh, and you can't see our first destination on here because this is really just showing you where the planets are. And our first destination is not a planet, it is in fact a moon. It is a moon of Jupiter specifically. So Jupiter has a lot of moons. It has 79 known moons. And several of them are really fascinating worlds and number of them could have made it onto this list. But the one I'm going to be focusing on is the moon Europa. So which whose uh, orbit Katie is highlighting right there. Europa is the fourth largest moon of Jupiter. Um, it's sixth largest in the whole solar system. It is about the size of our own moon. Our own moon is the fifth largest in the solar system. Um, so Europa is just a little bit smaller than our moon. And as you look at it here, it doesn't look like it should be on a list of top solar system destinations. It looks kind of cool, but not super interesting. That's because what's really fascinating about Europa isn't what's on the surface. Now, does anybody here happen to know what it is about Europa that makes it such an interesting target for further exploration? You can put your answer in the Q&A. And if you are not sure if any of the questions I asked today, you're not sure about the answer to, you can go ahead and just put question marks as your answer if you like, because one of the most important things in science is to know what you don't know. Let's see, uh, we have some guesses that it's an ocean under the surface water water yes europa is an ocean world it doesn't look like it on the surface that's because the ocean is under the surface it's not the only ocean world in the solar system we actually know of several of these outer moons that we think have liquid water oceans under their surface europa is still probably the most interesting of them though. We think europa's ocean is very very large we think uh, there is twice as much water under the surface of Europa than there is on the surface of Earth. So the what you're seeing here at the top layer, that is a thick layer of ice. And underneath that, we think is a very thick layer of liquid water ocean. So here's a diagram of what we think it looks like. And what's also exciting is we think that ocean could maybe have what it takes to support life. We think this is one of the places in the solar system most likely to be able to support life. And so it is a place we really want to know more about. And it's actually kept uh, all of these outer moons, they're kept warm enough to have these liquid water oceans, not by the warmth of the sun. We're out at Jupiter, the sun's about a 500 million miles away. That's really far. And it's way too far to keep uh, 
Europa warm enough to have this liquid layer, it's actually heating from what we call tidal heating. It's um, the gravity of the planet actually pulling on the moon, making the moon flex just a little bit. And that flexing generates friction, that friction generates heat. So it's actually heat being generated inside the moon by the planet's gravity. So in this case, Jupiter's gravity that allows Europa to maintain this, what we think is a liquid layer. So it may even be that there's more than one type of habitable environment in the layers of Europa because we also think uh, that not only is there this very large ocean under the crust of the ice, but inside the crust of the ice, we think there are pockets. And in those pockets, we think there are lakes. And that's kind of exciting because we see these sort of ice pocket lakes in Antarctica. This is a thing we see on Earth. And we've drilled down into those lakes in Antarctica and there is life in them. This is a place where life can survive, on Earth anyway. So there may be multiple kinds of environments um, in, in and or under Europa's crust where life could potentially survive. And we actually think um, we have evidence in some of these moons with these underwater oceans or underground oceans of hydrogen vents on the bottoms of the oceans, which would be very, very exciting because we have those on Earth too, and they act as food sources for whole ecosystems, which means there could be a lot of similarities between this ocean under the surface of Europa and the oceans deep uh, under the surface of the Earth. So deep under, deep in Earth's ocean. English is hard. And that's exciting because, well, again, we're very curious about the potential for life in places like this. We don't know if life could form, let alone survive, under the surface of the moon of a gas giant, but we want it, we think Europa could be a place where that could happen. So obviously we want to know more about Europa. We have sent many missions, well many, we've sent a few missions to Jupiter over the years, um, and we have one there now called Juno, but none of these missions have been specifically to look at the moons, and that is going to change. So Katie's actually gonna jump us ahead in time because um, there is a spacecraft that is being built right now that is going to be all about Europa. And there it is. Katie's jumped us forward in time in this program so that she can show us what this spacecraft looks like. It's called the Europa Clipper. It's going to launch in 2024 and it's going to arrive at Jupiter in 2030. This thing is being built right now for a launch in a few years, and it is actively going to study whether or not Europa is habitable. So this is one of, one of we're starting to get to the point in our studies of the solar system where we are sending spacecraft out there specifically to try and figure out if places in the solar system are currently habitable. It's kind of what Perseverance is working on on Mars. It's what Europa Clipper is going to be working on in the vicinity of Europa and Jupiter. And it's also kind of like how Perseverance, the Mars rover, is setting up for a future Mars mission by collecting samples that a future mission can um, pick up and bring back to Earth. Europa Clipper is also going to be setting up for a future Europa mission by looking for a landing site on the moon for a future Europa lander, because we really are very interested in this moon. We want to land something on the surface of Europa that can sample the ice directly, maybe drill down into one of these pocket lakes. We think the ice crust is probably too thick for us to drill all the way down into the ocean, but we'll see. And in the meantime, Clipper is being built as we speak. So that is my number five solar system destination. Number four, we have to go even farther away from the Earth. And it once again is not a planet. It is a moon because moons, if Europa shows us one thing, it's that moons um, are really fascinating worlds. We tend to think of planets as being the important places, but moons are really fascinating as well. And the next place on my list, the next solar system destination is a moon of Saturn. Now, Saturn has even more moons than Jupiter, 82 of them at last count. We keep finding more. 
and several of these are fascinating. One of another really great ocean world is out here, the moon Enceladus, but it's not Enceladus that I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about Saturn's biggest moon, Titan. Now Titan, as I said, is Saturn's largest moon. It is the second largest moon in the whole solar system. Um, so Europa was sixth largest, our moon is fifth largest, Titan is second, second only to the moon Ganymede, which orbits Jupiter. But Titan is the size of a planet, it's about the same size as Mercury. And as you look at it here, you might think, well, that doesn't look very impressive either, it looks like a fuzzy orange ball. And that's because you are not looking at the surface you are looking at the atmosphere because Titan has a thick, dense atmosphere. It is the only moon in the solar system with a thick, dense atmosphere, which automatically makes it different from other places in the solar system, a lot of other places in the solar system. And so in this case, uh, it's a little bit different from Europa because when we looked at Europa, what was interesting to us wasn't what was on the surface, it was what was under the surface. And that's not so here at Titan. We do think Titan may have one of those underground oceans, but that's still not what interests us about Titan. Does anybody happen to know what makes Titan unique amongst worlds in our solar system? You can go ahead and put it in the Q&A if you do. Remember, you can always put in question marks, or if you're not sure, you can take a wild guess if you like. Let's see, answers slowly coming in. Okay, we have a couple of guesses for the atmosphere. Um, someone wrote possibility of life, question mark. So maybe just in general, there's something there. Yeah, so the atmosphere is pretty unique amongst worlds in the solar system. And it is what uh, that atmosphere allows that makes Titan a unique world. Now, if you were to go under that atmosphere, if you were to look at the surface, which we can do via radar, and we have done via radar, uh, again, as we look at this, it doesn't look super impressive, but part of what you're seeing here is lakes and rivers. There are large bodies of water on the surface of Titan rivers and lakes, it rains on Titan. It's just not liquid water because the surface of Titan is quite cold. So water is frozen. In fact, what you're looking at there, the ground is not bed rock, it's bed ice. It is rock hard water ice. But there is a liquid cycle on Titan. It's just not liquid water, it is liquid methane. But that makes Titan the only place in the solar system other than Earth that has a liquid cycle. And we used to think, we used to assume that no place without liquid water could support life. And people wonder now if that's not kind of a narrow idea. Maybe it's not liquid water that life needs, maybe it's a liquid. Well, there's a lot of liquid on the surface of Titan. And it's even a carbon rich liquid, which life likes carbon. So could life exist? on a world that doesn't have liquid water, but has liquid methane instead. We don't know. Titan would be the perfect place for it if it could. So we want to know a whole lot more. We have explored this moon a little bit. Obviously I have these, uh, we have these radar pictures. Those are from the Cassini mission, which spent 13 years in orbit around Saturn and did get to pass by Titan a lot. And we have landed a craft on the surface of Titan. It's the only moon other than our own that we have landed something on. So what you're looking at here are images from the Huygens capsule. So when Cassini flew to Saturn, it was carrying this little lander on its back, Huygens. And on the left, we have pictures of that Huygens took during its descent down to the surface. And on the right, that is the shot it took of the surface. It landed in a mud puddle which was kind of expected. All those things that look like rock in the foreground, that is rock hard water ice. And you can see from the pictures on the left, there are mountains and ridges. Um, it did capture images of lakes and rivers and uh, Cassini got lots of radar images of them. So it's a world that is both very similar to earth and very different. Now Huygens, which landed on Titan in 2005, 
it lasted about two hours. It was only designed to last about two hours on the surface. So it wasn't a long-term exploration mission. And Brodo really told us is we want to know more. So there is a mission in the works to explore Titan in detail. And it's kind of an awesome mission. Its name is Dragonfly. And we just flew a helicopter on Mars in uh, 15 years. We we're going to fly a drone on Titan. So yes, if you didn't hear, the Ingenuity helicopter did fly on Mars yesterday. First time we've flown on another world. And it's sort of a, a good precursor for what Dragonfly is going to do. Dragonfly is going to be the first all flying mission. It's going to launch in 2027. It's supposed to arrive in 2036. So 15 years from now, you're going to have to wait. <laughs> but when it does, it's going to fly over 200 miles on the surface of Titan. And that is the by far, ten, about 10 times farther than any spacecraft has ever traveled on the surface of another world. We're going to see more of Titan than we've been up close than we've been able to see of any other world in our solar system and hopefully get to know whether or not it is habitable. This is another one of these missions to really see if places in our solar system other than Earth can support life. Now that was a lot of talking. Francisca, have any questions come in that we I should answer before we move on? Oh, let's see. We do have a lot of questions. Um, let's see. How do we find out about what the atmosphere in these moons are like? Yeah, so that's something we can do um, even from as far away as Earth, just by looking at the light that gets reflected back to Earth. Astronomers are very good at making light tell them everything they want to know about a place because for most places, light is all you have. You want to study a star in, or in a distant galaxy, all you have is the light. So we can tell that from a distance by looking at the light that gets reflected back um, and breaking it up into its component pieces and seeing what elements, the signatures of what elements are present in that light. In cases like Cassini, where Cassini got nice and up close, it can look in greater detail. And Huygens actually flew through the atmosphere of Titan. So it got to like taste the atmosphere. So it was able to get a lot more detail about what elements are present in that atmosphere. Thanks. And someone asked, why is the atmosphere yellow uh, here at the planet we're looking, or moon we're looking at? Uh, because unlike Earth, which has a carbon nit or, or a nitrogen oxygen atmosphere, or um, Mars, which has a mostly carbon dioxide atmosphere, uh, on Titan, you are looking at a methane-ethane atmosphere. So it depends on what the elements in the atmosphere are. And maybe one more question about Titan. Does it rain there? Do we know that? It does. It does. It rains methane, liquid methane. And Titan has lower gravity than Earth, so they, they fall much slower. But it does rain on Titan. It's got the full liquid cycle. All right, so we will move on to my... Number three solar system destination, this one is a planet. Uh, in fact, it's a planet relatively close to home, not Mars. We are doing plenty to explore Mars. I'm talking about our other neighbor, Venus. So Venus is often called Earth's sister planet, not because it looks anything like Earth, clearly, but because they are almost exactly the same size. Venus is just a little bit smaller. It is a nice broiling 800 degrees in the shade on the surface at all times. Uh, air pressure on the surface is about the same as if you were to go half a mile deep into the ocean. And you have, there's sulfuric acid in the clouds. There's no sunlight really, very little sunlight reaches the surface through this thick dense atmosphere. Cause once again, just like at Titan, we're not looking at the surface here. We are looking at the atmosphere, the clouds. And we think uh, the surface is covered in volcanoes, which may or may not still be erupting. It's actually a big debate amongst planetary scientists. So we can't see the surface from space unless, again, like Titan, we use radar, which we have done. We do know what the surface of Venus looks like. It's not a very inviting looking place. Pretty much it's, uh, it's bone dry because, again, 800 degrees. Uh, it's got lots of, anywhere you see those, any circular features, those are volcanoes, they are mountains. 
Um, and it's just generally a not pleasant place. So why do I want to explore this place so badly? Well, one of the reasons we love exploring Mars is we know Mars went through a period in its past where it was warm and wet, or at least cold and wet. It had a lot of liquid water on the surface. It had a thicker atmosphere. The surface was a lot warmer than it is now. It was a much more habitable place. And so one of the reasons we like to go to Mars is to see if maybe life of some sort could have existed there. Venus does not seem like a very likely candidate for that, but Venus was once much more Earth-like. We think it did have liquid water on its surface. It had a much nicer climate, and we think it had that climate for a much, much longer period than Mars did. We tend to hold up Mars as this example of the most potentially habitable planet in the solar system other than Earth. But actually Venus may have had, may have been habitable for billions of years, uh, longer than Mars, way longer than Mars. And there's even some theories that it was less than a billion years ago that Venus's, at, Venus's surface began to change and it became the very unpleasant place it is today. So why, given this, don't we go and look for signs that there, is once, there was once life on Venus? Well, it's not as easy to explore as Mars. So it takes a lot longer to get to Venus. Even though it's closer than, uh, to us than Mars is, Venus is also closer to the sun. Going to the sun, towards the sun, towards Venus, means the sun's gravity pulls on you and speeds you up. If you just went directly from Earth to Venus, the sun's gravity would speed up the spacecraft so much that it would fly right by Venus and miss it completely. So you can't go directly there. You have to do a big, slow spiral in, and that takes a long time. So it's a long time to get to Venus. And then spacecraft don't tend to do well on the surface of Venus. The last uh, spacecraft that landed on the surface of Venus was launched by the Soviet Union it was the Vega 2 mission in 1985. And the record for longest spacecraft survival on Mars is about two hours. Because again, it is 800 degrees, it's extremely high pressure, and it occasionally rains sulfuric acid. So it's not a great environment for spacecraft to last a long time in, but there are a lot of ideas for things that we could do that would allow us to do a long period uh, observation of Venus without our spacecraft melting into a puddle. First of all, we've got all sorts of new uh, materials that we could build spacecraft out of that we did not have in 1985. Um, there are ideas for putting things like gliders into the atmosphere so that they stay maybe at a place with a lower temperature. Um, there's a mission called, a mission under consideration called Da Vinci which is going, would be an atmospheric probe, which would measure things all the way down to the surface. And my favorite idea is something called Zephyr, which would actually be a lander driven by a wind sail. So it would actually live on the surface of Venus and be driven by Venus's winds from place to place. Now, none of these are, neither of these are, um, missions are currently under development. There is no mission currently being built to go to Venus. So it's going to remain mysterious for a while, but at least there are a couple under consideration. That puts it sort of one step above my number two place in the solar system. This one's a little bit of a cheat because it's not one place, it's actually two. Because I've been talking about all these moons that we know so much about, but there are planets in our solar system that are still very mysterious to us. And I'm specifically talking about the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. These are sometimes distinguished, for, they are gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn. They get distinguished sometimes because they have different chemicals in their atmosphere. They're very similar to each other, but not to Jupiter and Saturn, other than being made of gas. They're about the same size as each other. And they are the least explored planets in our solar system. They've never had a spacecraft go in orbit around them. The closest they've come is to have a spacecraft fly by them in the 80s. And that's it. That's the only time a spacecraft's ever been close to them. So let's look at Uranus. Uranus here has more extreme seasons than anywhere in the solar system uh, because it's tilted all the way over on its side. Most pictures of Uranus look like this. They have no, no particular um, distinguishing features. 
That's because this one is what it looked like when Voyager flew by in the 80s. But since then, the seasons have shifted and we've seen long distance observations of Uranus showing it forming gigantic storm systems over its Northern hemisphere. This is a thing we've never seen up close. And we'd love to see that up close. It's a whole different way than we've ever been able to observe this planet. So we also know that Uranus has 27 moons. It probably has a lot more that we haven't been able to see. We, it's much easier to find moons around Jupiter and Saturn, which are closer than Uranus and Neptune, which are a lot farther away. And speaking of Neptune, we know that Neptune has extreme storm, storm systems. We've seen them. It's had a great dark spot appear on it that gets compared to Jupiter's great red spot that comes and goes. This storm system comes sometimes and then it vanishes and sometimes it comes back again. So we'd love to know more about what's going on there. We think there are layers of the atmospheres of these planets where it rains diamonds. Um, so that's a different kind of rain, very unpleasant. It means it's raining really hard rocks. And if you look at Neptune's moons, Neptune's moons are probably mostly captured which means they came from somewhere else. And in this case, we think they probably came from the Kuiper belt, which is the region out where Pluto lives. And it would take a very, very, very long time to get a spacecraft out to the Kuiper belt. And then it would only get to view maybe one or two objects. If you want to study the Kuiper belt, going to Neptune is actually a great place to do it because that's where a lot of its moons came from. Both of these planets have ring systems, which have never been studied up close. Um, and that are very, very different from the ring system around Saturn. So these are planets in our own solar system that we know very little about. And there are no missions to these planets currently being designed. Some folks are thinking about potential future designs and there is a possibility of a Neptune flyby mission being up for consideration. It hasn't won funding though. So right now the ice giants are, in my personal opinion, very, very sadly neglected. And I know we're running out of time, so I'm gonna to jump to my last uh, location before we stop for questions. And this one's a bit of a cheat because the solar system in question is not ours. So I'm talking about the next solar system over, Proxima Centauri. How could we explore that up close? It's light years away. Well, there is a private group called Breakthrough Initiative there's a, uh, a, an artist rendition of the planet that we, the one planet we know is going around Proxima Centauri. We think there now is a second planet as well. Breakthrough Initiatives comes up with ideas for uh, trying to explore or learn more about the universe, sort of big out there ideas. And one of their ideas is Breakthrough Starshot. Starshot would use a light sail powered spacecraft to, that is sped up by a laser array on the earth to travel to our nearest neighbor at a speed of about 20% the speed of light. So here's an artist's rendition of a light sail. At 20% the speed of light, this very tiny spacecraft, we could only send a very small one, uh, would take 20 to 30 years to get to our next door neighbor in the universe. And it would then take four years for any data from that spacecraft to be transmitted back to Earth. So 34 years sounds like a long time to wait, but remember it's gonna take 15 years before Dragonfly lands on Titan. Long waiting periods are not necessarily weird with spacecraft. The Voyager missions have been traveling for over 40 years. So this is not an impossible dream. In fact, light sails have been tested. This is not an artist rendition. This is a real photo of a light sail being, of light sail two, in fact, being tested uh, over the Earth. Now the laser array that we would need to speed up this light sail powered spacecraft doesn't exist yet, but it's not a completely impossible idea that within the next several decades, we could be sending a spacecraft not to a place in our own solar system, but to go check out the solar system next door, which would be very, very cool. And I know I've gone over time, Francisca, I am happy to answer some questions if we think we can before we go. Yeah, uh, we have the Peter Kirk Elementary School with us from Kirk Lane, Washington, and they asked a couple questions. Oh, wonderful. Uh, they ask, what is the largest moon in our solar system? The largest moon is Ganymede, which orbits Jupiter. Okay, and maybe, hopefully, maybe we know about this. 
what is the newly discovered ninth planet? Ah, so we have not discovered a ninth planet. There is some evidence that there might be one out there, another gas giant. So maybe like a, a large Neptune, something around the size of Neptune. Um, out past Pluto, we think there might be something out there. We've we're basing that um, on the orbits of a few Kuiper Belt objects, which look like they might be being affected by the gravity of a large object. But some people say that that's not what they indicate. Some people say that is definitely what they indicate. We looked for a massive object out there. We have not found one. Um, so we don't have any direct evidence for the existence of a ninth planet, but we have some indirect evidence. And so we are looking to see if we can find one. Well, thank you. And thank you, Peter Kirk Elementary, for asking those questions. Sadly, we have reached <laughs> over the end of our program. So I'll ask you all to uh, virtually join me in thanking Talia and Katie for sharing their awesome space knowledge and taking us through that ride. And I'll ask you both to say goodbye and turn off your camera. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Bye. And thank you again for learning with us today, everyone. Check out NASA's eyes to explore space on your own and join us for more guided explorations every Tuesday. You can find all of our virtual offerings by visiting us online at mos.org slash mos at home. And if you enjoy the program and are able, we hope you'll consider making a donation to the Museum of Science. You can do that by visiting the red link on the screen engage.mos.org slash welcome and your support will help us continue this programming. Thank you all and have a good afternoon.